Find somebody to say hi to. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Thank you for entering in and worshiping today. Amen. We're glad you're out, and God's just going to bless you today. We have a, a friend, new, new voice in our church. He's not spoke at our church before. I've heard of Joe Morris for years and years, and a few months ago, a year and a half or so ago, he was down to a mutual friend, Mark Boer's church in Boise, Idaho, and it's a great church down there in Boise. And um, just had a signal from the Lord that we needed Joe to come and embrace our house and bring his gift. You know, we're not looking for a sermon topic, topic as much as we are looking for a download from heaven for our hour and our moment. Our prayer has been for him to have exact word for our house, and I just believe God's going to fulfill that. Can you say amen? So uh, Joe Morris has been in ministry maybe his whole life. His, he was, was sharing yesterday. His mom was a fanatic. She was, I, I, I won't, I mean, all out. I, think, I don't think he used the word psycho, but maybe he did. <laughs> but she was psychologically hooked up to the Lord. They went to church every night for years, every night. And those things got off on Joe. He's a profound uh, a voice today in these last days of, about What's going on in this earth? How many know that there's some things going on in our earth? It's crazy time. But you know what? God turns the world upside down, causes them to lose their mind so that his will will be done. So today, as Brother Joe comes, let's just stand and give him a, a welcome from Spokane Christian Center and allow him to speak into your life. Come on up. Praise the Lord. Praise thank the Lord. thank, thank you, Pastor Rick. Bless you. Way. Thank have you. Appreciate way. it. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, I believe so. Praise the Lord. Thank you. No, no, no. You can be seated. Good to see you this morning. A uh, treat to be with you. I've heard about your church for years. I think I, I've known your pastors for years. Years ago, a minister I worked for would come through here, and I just missed being able to come with him one time. I think it was 85 or 86, but uh, uh, I've known about you guys, and I love your building, your location, and you have a park. How cool to come up to your church and have trees like this. It's just beautiful, and to have a, a, a I can call it a harvesting barn for souls. A, a, everything you're doing is about reaching people, and I, I, I love your pastor's thought pattern. Just we get to be around each other and hear each other talk about the word. Uh, it's so good to know that we're saved. So good to know we have authority. So good to thank God we got in this. I think about, we we're talking about my mother. I call her my, my psycho mom, word lady. Uh, a friend of mine, a pastor in California said that I had a drug problem growing up. I did. My mother drugged me to church. <laughs> but <laughs> it's the incorruptible seed. <laughs> and when it's sown, it grows up and it becomes. So uh, it, it is, it, it's unchangeable. It, it changes everything. When it's sown, it grows up and it becomes. And I love your reverence for Jesus. You know, you come into a different church. I'm in a different church every week, you know, and I, I come in and I smell. What do I smell in your church? I smell a humility and a love for the Lord. They're, 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 I'm impressed with one thing is that I love for Jesus. And uh, if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. And so just as Pastor Rick said, look, what a time to be on the planet when there's chaos and bad things happening. But there's no bad news for the church. I mean, it's amazing how the, the world is set up for some really radical times, and even the radical times for the world is really pressure to get them to make a decision. We think of the tribulation being a bad time. It really is, but some people are so hard-headed, they need some uh, uh, activities to pressure them to, to turn. Thank God we've turned. Thank God somebody prayed for us, and we're all here. We look back at how privileged we are to hear the Word. I went to Bible school in 80, and before that, like I said, my mom ha hauled me around to all these meetings, and privileged to be there to hear the word and look how it's changed your life you have a dominion about you you have a victory about you you have a joy about you, you know, in his presence is fullness of joy i get around people they go well, i'm a real prayer i go no you're not you'd be happy if you prayed come on <laughs> amen uh, there's something about his personality he called himself the oil of gladness above thy fellows so he called himself the life of the party amen there is no depression in him oppression is far from you amen so uh, just privileged to be with you and exciting to try to get into some things this morning to show us where we are in time. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing that there's more verses written about right now than anything in the Bible. 
Now think about that. There's more verses written about what it would look like right before Jesus came. Why would He do that? He wants us to have a heads up. Because you, you change the way you live. You change everything when you realize Jesus is about to come back. He even said this. He said, when you see these things, lift up your head for your redemption is drawing nigh. So the whole thing is about you having a heads up. So He wants us to make some changes. We talk about my mom. My mom used to scare me so bad. She'd say every night, hey, Jesus is coming tonight. And I'm like, yikes. Well... <laughs> It freaked me out as a kid, but I, you can either respond with humility or haughtiness. And we humble ourselves to go, Lord, what do you want us to do? We see these signs that point to your return. We see all these things happening in the earth that are a, a, a sign of how close we are. And that's what we'll get into this morning. Let's look at the scripture. You know, we've had a weird thought pattern that you can't tell when the Lord's coming back. But actually, there's all these verses written about it to help us. So we'll get into this this morning. So we're very, very privileged and blessed. So grab your Bibles, if you would, and you just turn wherever you think I'll turn. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now, why don't we go to Second Peter, and we'll start with chapter 3. I wish Colleen, my wife, could be here with me. She's back in Tulsa. Uh, we have a daughter that's married, 30 years old, so we're blessed. Colleen runs our office. And uh, she hasn't got to go with me a lot lately, but she sends her greetings from Tulsa. Let's pray and we'll get right into the word. Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for, for what you've given us over the years. We're, we're appreciative. We have a thought pattern of gratefulness. Thank you for being raised from the dead. Thank you for overcoming death, hell, and the grave. Help us, Father, in this hour, walk in the full measure of what you left us 2,000 years ago. I thank you that the households are blessed in this church, that the kids are blessed in this church, Lord. Everything they set their hand to would prosper. And Lord, we, we, we come to you today uh, uh, receiving your word to change us and alter us. Prepare us for these last days. Prepare us to do your bidding. We, we cooperate with you, Father, in this hour so that you would make every person in this room a mouthpiece, a spokesman for God. Use them, Father, right before you return. We thank you for it. And Lord, we know as we get into these verses, we'll see you today high and lifted up with your train filling the temple. We lift you up as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We magnify you, honor you, Jesus, in this room. Receive the honor that's due your name, Jesus. Amplify your voice from this location, Lord. We thank you for what you've spoken over this church, Lord, over the years. We thank you for, for the fulfillment of everything that was prophesied over this house. We thank you for great grace upon every believer in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said amen. amen. Turn there to 2 Peter, if you would, chapter 3. And we, we all know the verses, but let's go through some things that the Holy Ghost used Peter to say uh, right before he was about to go home to be with the Lord. He said, I must shortly put off my tabernacle. So you know when you're about to leave somebody, you say certain things that really registers with people. So look what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved... I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Notice the tone there. He calls you his beloved. Okay, in the Gospels, we find out, uh, 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 amazing, when Jesus is talking to the Jewish guys there, he said of that day and that hour, no one knows. But when you get into the epistles, he said, you are not in darkness, so that day would overtake you as a thief. So we have all these verses about what it would look like, and the tone here, before the Holy Ghost starts talking here, he calls you his beloved. He's not mad at you. He's not frustrated with you, not agitated with you. He loves you. And the whole purpose of end-time preaching, getting to a thought pattern of how close we are, is that He loves you so much. I mean, think about it. When my phone rings and my daughter's picture comes up there, I can't wait to talk to my little girl, even though she's married, been married for six years. I live to get to talk to her. Well, Jesus is looking forward to seeing you face to face. And the whole purpose of end-time preaching today is to have a radical expectation and a radical hope and a radical joy. Great hope, great joy. I had a minister, a famous minister say to me, if you preach on end times, Joe, you just get everybody's hopes up. Duh, it's the hope that purifies you even as you're pure. So it is kind of amazing. He actually wants you expectant. He wants you happy. And once we get into it, we, we've been taught wrong that we can't tell when the Lord's coming back, yet there's more verses written about it than anything in the book. So let's get into this. So he calls us his beloved, and he goes down a little further there. He said that you'd be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us and the apostles, the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, they'll come in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lust saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So He tells you the climate, people would be scoffing, and then they start saying, hey, we've been hearing that all of our lives. Now that's kind of crept into the church. Well, I've been hearing the Lord's coming all my life. Well, you know why? Because He's coming. Yeah. Well, look at the next verse. He clears things up for us in the next verse. That, 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 for this they willingly are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, they forgot about the flood. 
change came when no one believed a change was coming. And you feel that right now. People go, well, you know, things are just going to continue. No, they're not going to continue. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Amen? And you think about that, that, that Noah preached that the rain was coming. No one believed him. And Jesus compared the times to exactly like we are right now. And, but it's weird that Hollywood has more of a sense of change than the church. I mean, they, they sense it, so they, they have movies about zombies, the walking dead. I mean, how weird is that? They sense a resurrection coming, but they don't know how to interpret it. We know what's coming. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we're going to be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the greatest change for your life is very, very soon. That's the rapture of the church. Thank God we're going to get glorified bodies. I'm looking forward to that. Never to gain weight again. Come on. Amen. If you can't get excited about it, get excited about that. This mortal is going to put on immortality. We've borne the image of the earthy. We're going to bear the image of the heavenly. I mean, what a radical change to all of a sudden have a body that's fashioned like unto his. I'm in. Hallelujah. Never get tired again. I'm quickened right now, and I'm enjoying millennial blessings right now, but I'm sure looking forward to never gaining weight. See, my weight is perfect. I'm just not the right height. So anyway, changes are coming, and Jesus is coming, and the rapture of the church is coming. There's a lot of preaching against the rapture right now. But you're going to be caught up. Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. Jesus was raptured. So we're living very close to that. So we're going to look this morning at the signs of the second coming. Because the rapture is signless, but the second coming has sign after sign after sign after sign. So if we can look at that, we can go, wow, the Lord's about to come back. Why would He do that? It's just like in football. When you come to the two-minute warning, you change everything. Could you imagine being in the Super Bowl, two-minute warning, and you go back to the huddle, and the quarterback goes, I need you to go long. You go, oh, my knees are hurting. Really? Your knees are hurting? This is the, come on. So you, 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 you've got to get that thought pattern that he's about to come back so we make changes. And he wants you supernaturally excited about seeing him. I don't know what the protocol from going to faith to sight is, but my friend, these songs that we sing where we honor him and we bless him and we magnify him, all of a sudden we're going to be caught up and you're going to stand before the king of kings. Come on, eyes of the flame of fire, feet like undefined brass, voice of many waters. My friend, the, 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 the preparation for that, that's pretty radical. And really the Lord compares it to a wedding. How many of you are excited the night before your wedding? Come on. So there should be an excitement in the church. You're about to see him face to face. So let's look at some other things that show us here. I mean, there's so much you can get into, but I want to buzz over to Isaiah for a minute, and it'll give you an indication why we preach on end times. So look at Isaiah 46, and let's go through this for a second. Isaiah chapter 46, look at verse number 9. It's page 819 if you've got a Bible like mine. It will be cool when we all have the same Bible. Praise the Lord. Look at Isaiah 46, if you've got time to go over to verse 9. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old. I'm God, there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Pretty wild. He said, This is how you can tell this book is authentic. I'll tell you what's going to happen before it happens. So Lucifer fights end time preaching because it gives authenticity to the scripture. He said, this is how you tell I'm God. I'm going to tell you future before it happens. Ezekiel prophesied the very year Israel will be made a nation. Happened exactly as he said. Gabriel told Daniel the year Jesus would come the first time came exactly on the right date. Because this is how God said, this is how you can tell I'm God. Now hang with me. No other religion can do this. You can talk to a Buddhist, you can talk to a Muslim, their book doesn't give you future. You're, th this is the only book that tells you what's going to happen before it happens. Now listen to this. This is a lot of info, but run with me mentally for a minute. Listen to the first ten names of guys in the Bible. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahilial means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death brings. Lamech means despairing. And Noah means rest. Listen to them put together, the first ten names of guys in the Bible. Man is appointed mortal with sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death brings the despairing rest. Gives you the entire plan of redemption with the first ten names of guys in the Bible. Because he says, I'm God. Now he's watching over his word to perform it. Oh, come on. We're, we're, we know where we are in this church. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Come on. He's already presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Come on. So, so we, we have a dad that's flawless. And you're watching the earth. Once we get into all the signs, you're watching everything in the earth get ready for what happens right after we leave. 
I mean, it's amazing. They asked what the Lord's going to look like. They're Jewish guys, so Jesus told them the tribulation is a sign of His coming. Seven years of, of signs. Now, in high school, when I was dating girls, I would take fireworks with me, so I would pull over and shoot fireworks off, so I'd say, hey, you can't say you didn't go out with me and didn't see fireworks. Praise the Lord. You do whatever you got to do. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I didn't do it once. I did it many times. Well, the earth's getting ready for seven years of fireworks. God's going to get people's attention. You're going to have asteroids hitting. You're going to have water turned to blood. You're going to have all this stuff happening. But, but you're watching the setup for the Ezekiel 38 war, uh, and we're not even in the tribulation. You're watching Russia's gone into Crimea. Russia's gone into the Ukraine. Putin quoted Hitler twice, and not one world leader said a word. And now there's Russian military bases all over Syria that are helping Iran. You've got Russian equipment every single day coming into Syria because the Bible says right after the rapture of the church, Russia is going to invade Israel. The setup is happening for it right now. So we're very, 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 very privileged that we can connect the dots. So what does that tell us? That tells us we're about to see Jesus. So it's so an excitement and it's also a kick in the pants to do the will of God. Like, wow, there's the finish line. Let's run faster, not slower. You know, my daughter in high school, we're going to get to all the science here in just a second, but you know, my daughter in high school was a cross-country runner. She would train and train and train and not even get tired. Freak me out. I would train with her on my motorcycle. I'd run right beside her. And, and you know, I would be tired, tireder than her after me riding, and she's running. You know, and she, she did that so that when she's in the races, she wouldn't get fatigued. I'd go to her cross-country events, you know, and I'd stand there at the first mile marker. She'd come running up, how far, Daddy? How far, Daddy? Lauren, you got two more miles. Pace yourself. She, I'd go around to the other mile marker. I'd stand there. She'd come running up. How far, Daddy? How far, Daddy? I'd go, Lauren, you got two more miles. Another mile. You can do it. You can do it. Save your energy for the very end. I would get to the last mile marker. She'd come around the corner. She wouldn't say, how far, Daddy? She saw the finish line, and she, her, her, her change in her face was so radical. There's the finish line. All that training's for right there. I'm screaming, run, Lauren, run, Forrest, run. You know? so, so the training wasn't to come to the end of chill. The training wasn't to come to the end and just kind of, well, that's interesting. No, the finish line makes you pick up the pace. Now, we're living in a day when people are casual about church. It, this is about being adamant about church. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as some would do, especially as you see the day approaching. We're going to get into about, about 10 or 12 signs. There's about 50 that show us we're watching the, the, the preparation for the entrance of God himself to come back to the planet. The Bible says the mountains are going to vibrate and break at the second coming when creation all of a sudden meets the Creator. Oh, come on. You talk about an entrance. The heavens are going to fold away and there'll be no light. All of a sudden, the brightest light you've ever seen or ever will see, the glory of God in the face of Jesus is going to radiate and come right back to this planet and every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess that He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we're, we're watching the setup for it, so we're very, very privileged. Now hang with me. Go to Luke if you would. Let's talk about this for a second because it's very, very precise. Look at Luke 21 and go over to verse 24. I want you to think about this. I know it's a lot of info, but think about the precision of the first coming of the Lord. How many of you in school didn't like trigonometry, didn't like algebra, didn't like geometry, and then it went to statistics? Wasn't that crazy when it went to statistics? Uh, I can't even say it. It freaked me out. But anyway... Uh, Listen to the odds of the, of the preparation of the first coming of the Lord. Listen to how precise this is. It was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah. He'd be preceded by a messenger. He'd be given away for 35 pieces of silver. He'd be thrown into a potter's field. They would crucify him. He would be crucified in between thieves. He wouldn't open his mouth before his accusers. They'd gamble over his robe. They'd put a crown of thorn on, thorns on him. They'd pierce him in his side. <laughs> I like this one. This one's pretty hard. It got dark in the middle of the day while he was crucified. You know what the odds are of all those prophecies coming to pass in one generation? It's 480 trillion times a billion. It's 480 with 33 zeros afterwards. Even in science, after so many zeros, it's absurd to think that it happened by chance. Okay? For every one verse there is about the first coming, eight times more about the second coming. The flawlessness of the first coming, and you're watching the earth get set up for the second coming. So let's go to Luke here and look at this. So if there's eight times more verses about this, why would God do that so that we'd make some changes in our lives? Jesus is just about to come back. 
So look at Luke 21. Grab your Bibles there. Look at Luke 21. Look at verse 24. We're going to run through the signs because the, the signs will preach to us how near we are. You know, if you're driving into Spokane, maybe you're 100 miles away. You're on a freeway. Maybe it's I-90. Uh, uh, and the, the sign says 100 miles from Spokane. Next sign says 80 miles from Spokane. Next sign says 50. Next sign says 40. You don't freak out and go, I'm never going to make it to Spokane. No. The signs told you you're going near Spokane. Okay. Once you get into Spokane, you don't need signs anymore. You got signals. You have traffic signals. We're going to look at signs today of his return, and then it goes to signals. You're done with the signs. They're all there, and you've gone into signals now. And the Lord's so wonderful and so sweet. He's, he's basically saying, hello, heads up, I'm about to come back. So look at Luke 21, look at verse 24. Jesus speaking here said, They'll fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down or overthrown of the Gentiles or nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now that's pretty radical that Jesus tied everything to a city being won back. He said when the, when the Jews get Jerusalem back, time's up. That's pretty wild. When did that happen? 1967. Keep that date in your brain. So it is amazing that everything revolves around Jerusalem. If you live west of Jerusalem, you read left to right. If you live east of Jerusalem, you read right to left. Everything goes back to that piece of real estate. In our country last year, a hundred years from when the Balfour Declaration came out, made the decision to move our embassy to Jerusalem last year. And that happened two weeks ago. Come on, that's a huge deal. And we'll get into more about that. I mean, it's radically amazing. 100 years from 1917, our country goes, hey, we're moving our embassy to the capital, which is Jerusalem. I mean, the devil's so stupid. <laughs> I mean, he's so stupid. You can go to Israel, you can go into Jerusalem, and there's a mosque right there. What happened right there? That's where Jesus was raised from the dead. There's a mosque right there. What happened? That's where Jesus was beaten. There's a mosque right there. What happened right there? That's where the ascension was. The devil's so stupid, he put a mosque everywhere Jesus did something important, so you don't even need a tour guide. You can go, what happened there? Jesus did something cool. What happened there? He did something cool there. So, so but everything's going to come back to that, that city. It's amazing. Not one miracle, a city uh, being brought back to the Jews. I mean, the miracles that happened, man, you don't have time to get into it, but uh, you remember the, the Egyptian army was, was coming on to Israel trying to annihilate it. Syria, Jordan, all these nations had surrounded Israel in 67. Egyptian armies barreling down on Israel, 88 tanks. One Israeli guy, he was a cook. He said, you know what, if I'm going to die, I'm going to go out in style. He figured out, can you imagine trying to figure out how to fire shells out of a tank all of a sudden? He jumps into the tank and goes, okay, how's this work? You know, he's messing with the, I mean, just try to figure out how to fire shells at 88 tanks coming at him. Starts firing shells. Fires another shell, fires another shell. Eventually, the, the Egyptian commander waves a flag up in the morning and said, I'm surrendering to the highest ranking officer. The Israeli guy looks around and goes, highest ranking officer, it's just me. He goes, oh, no, it's not just you. The whole night, the countryside was filled with tanks with men dressed in white on the front of their tanks. You've been shelling us all night, and we can't take it anymore. <laughs> See, it's called a miracle, divine intervention. Now, you can, you can look at the video of them interviewing those guys. Those Jewish men said, we don't even believe in this stuff, but something happened that day. They don't believe it after the fact. We believe before we see. Amen? We're faith people. Well, it's amazing that God did that. He intervened in them to get Jerusalem back. That's pretty radical in our lifetime. So watch what Jesus says to make this even clearer. Because I was in Israel last year. The Jordanian government came out saying, hey, we can't let Israel, now hang with me, we can't let Israel buy any more land in Petra. Man, I freaked out because you know what? The Jews are going to go to Petra for safety after we're raptured. And they've been buying up property. ISIS has been damming up the Euphrates River almost for two years. Now that freaked me out. You know why? Because the Bible says the Euphrates River will run dry at the second coming and the kings of the east will come over. So you've got physical, tangible events happening that point to Jesus coming back to the planet. So here Jesus said, hey, look at Jerusalem. Well, that's one back. Time's up. So watch what he says to make it even clearer. Look at verse 29. He said, look at the fig tree. That's the nation of Israel. He says, when they now shoot forth, this is pretty amazing. He said, look at Israel and all the trees, the prophetic trees around them. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves. That summer, our harvest is nigh at hand. Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, freak out and run into the woods. No. <laughs> Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Wow. He didn't say you'd wonder. He didn't say you would sense. 
He said you could know it. You could know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, you ready for the next verse? I'm glad the Lord said this. Not some preacher said this. Jesus said it. Verse 32, Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass away to all is fulfilled. What generation? The one that sees Israel made a nation and the one that sees Jerusalem won back. And I see, I hear people go, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. It don't matter. <laughs> I hear people go, I, hear people go I, I, I don't believe that. It don't matter. Jesus said, the group that sees those two, you're it. So we're privileged. We're privileged. And Jesus said, you could see this and you could know this. Now hang with me. Brother Hagin prophesied before he went home to be with the Lord. I remember being in the meeting in the 80s. He said there'd be a spirit of seeing and knowing upon the church. Where'd that come from? That verse right there. An attitude of seeing and knowing. Now hang with me, man. This is a bunch of dates, but this is so cool. 1917. An Australian general comes into Jerusalem to, to liberate Jerusalem for the Jews. Now hang with me. And, and they passed out flyers back then. They would pass out leaflets before they would come in and bomb a, a, a city. And the leaflet said, Alamee's coming, Alamee's coming. In Arabic, it meant a prophet sent from God to deliver you your land. So he comes flying in in, in, a, in a biplane. They'd never seen a plane before. And man, they dropped their guns going, how are we going to fight against God? Here, there's Alamee right there flying in a flying machine. So they dropped their weapons right then, 1917. Jerusalem gets handed over to the Jews. Then the Balfour Declaration came from England saying Israel has a right to their land. The Palestinians are trying to sue England the last couple of years over the Balfour Declaration because there's documentation that Israel is supposed to have that land. Same year, 1917, remember it's a big year, Kenneth Hagin was born. Remember the Lord appeared to his mother <laughs> and said to name him John, and she didn't name him John, <laughs> said that he would have a part in getting the earth ready for the second coming. Now I've preached in Rome, Australia, I've preached in Rome, Italy, I've preached in Rome, Germany, I've preached in Rome, Singapore, I've preached in Rome, Norway, I've preached in Rome, Switzerland. I preached in Rome, Paris last year. Hang with me, 25 years ago, You'd preach there. They're clipping their nails. They're so bored. Now, you preach seven hours on Friday, eight hours on Saturday, and they're mad when you stop. The pastor got up and said, Joe's mom preached here. My mother preached in that church. I preached in that church, and my daughter Lauren preached in that church. Three generations. I'm telling you, there's a revival going on over there, all because of Kenneth Hagin's mentality to get the word out. No flash, no fanfare, no zip, no doo-dah. I remember when my mom would take me to Brother Hagin meetings. I'm going, my God, is that the only message he knows is Mark 11, 23? You know, as a kid, I'm like, seriously? You were going to open to Mark 11, 23 again? We'd go to Pittsburgh, Mark 11, 23. Go to Miami, Mark 11, 23. Go to Dallas, Mark 11, 23. Hello? Is that all you know? Well, a man, that the Lord tells his mother that he would have a part, not everything, a part heart and get in the earth ready for the second coming of the Lord. You know what Hagen means in the Hebrew? One, to go before, to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. So with no fanfare, no zip, no doodah, <laughs> as boring as you could possibly be, sowing the word, sowing the word, sowing the word, sowing the word. And this morning you have in you, you have a, a dominion mentality in you that you have what you say. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Come on. So here... The exact year that Allenby flies into Jerusalem. So, so let's run through these for a minute. This is pretty crazy. Jesus says here in verse 32, This generation won't pass away till all is fulfilled. Heaven and earth will be altered, but you can't alter this. You can't change my words. So we're that generation. So those are two main signs. Israel made a nation and Jerusalem won back. Pretty radical. So let's go through some of the others because there's so many. It's so cool. Let's just quickly go through them. I know it's a lot of information, but it shows you how wonderful the Bible is. Amen. What's the next sign after those? The Hebrew language restored. The Bible says right before the coming of the Lord, He'd restore to them a pure language. A hundred years ago, no one spoke Hebrew. Now they all speak Hebrew. It's a miracle. I was there one time in 2001. Now I'm a hillbilly from Louisiana. That's where I'm from. And my buddies got me, God bless you, amen. <laughs> my buddies got me in this meeting to go meet with Ariel Sharon. Now I'm nervous. I'm thinking, what in the world am I doing going in to meet with Ariel Sharon? This was the prime minister of Israel at the time. So I'm nervous, you know, and I'm sitting there going, man, this is weird, this is weird, this is crazy. I mean, there's the black and white pictures of gold in my ear, Ixtoc Rabin, you know, all that, the leather chairs. And I'm going, what am I doing going in here? So I thought, well, I'll get me a pencil with some Hebrew writing on it, you know, for a souvenir. I grabbed the pencil, and it was made in Iowa. So that's not cool, man. I want a, I want a Hebrew pencil, you know. All of a sudden, I can hear them walking down the hall. I can't do it, but they're speaking perfect Hebrew. hundred years ago, no one spoke Hebrew. Now, they all speak Hebrew. You should Google that. You know when that's happened before? Never. 
Never has there been a language lost like that and recovered. Happened in your lifetime. You can't find anybody speaking Hittite. You can't find anybody speaking Amorite. You can't find anybody speaking Canaanite. But you can see the footprint of the Jews. Come on, with the pants that we wear. Uh, a man named Levi had a bunch of fabric building tents. And he said, we've got too much, too much fabric for tents. Why don't we make some blue jeans? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> so we see the language restored. When? In our lifetime. Because the Bible said it would happen right before the coming of the Lord. All right, let's look at the next sign. The next sign is pretty big. The Ethiopian Jews brought back. Okay, because God said he would do this right before the coming of the Lord. So the C-130s flew from Israel right down into Ethiopia. And 18,000 of them were airlifted in one day. Now Chuck Roberts on Headline News. Listen to this. He said, an exodus that eclipses the book of Exodus. When you've got an unsaved man on CNN News preaching about how cool it is that God brought them out in one day greater than the Exodus in the Bible, hey, Jesus is coming back. Come on, I mean, he didn't go, he didn't go, my God! But he, but he said it just like that. An Exodus that eclipses the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus was a pretty cool deal. The waters of the sea were congealed and they walked right across. Because God said, I'll do this right before I come back. So you got... Israel regathered as a nation. The miracle of that is amazing in itself. The fig tree budding. Hitler killed six million Jews right before the fig tree budded. Lucifer thought, if I can keep the word of God from coming to pass. But he couldn't keep the word of God from coming to pass. So you got Israel brought back as a nation. You got Jerusalem won back. You got the Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. What's the next one we can look at? These are tangible, physical things to show you Jesus is about to come back to the planet. All right, the next one would be the revival of the Roman Empire. Now that's pretty, pretty right in our face. That's called the EU, the United States of Europe. Last year I preached in Norway, flew from Norway to Nice. They don't even stamp your passport. I wanted that stamp on my passport. It's really cool. It says Cote d'Azur on there. They don't even do it anymore because it'd be like going from Washington into to Montana. You don't have to go through passport control to get into Montana. Amen? So the EU is a nation that's come together, revival the Roman Empire. They said we felt like Romans on that day. All right, now the, it's the platform for the Antichrist, okay? Here's some homework. Sunday morning, you can go and get on your computer and Google the Capitol building in Strasbourg, France. It's not similar to the Tower of Babel. It's identical to the Tower of Babel. It's that system. We'll build our own way to heaven. No, you won't. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Google it today and look at it. It's not similar to it. It's identical. You can look at the markings inside the building. They're all from Nebuchadnezzar. You can look at the art out in front of the building, and it's a molecule of iron magnified because Daniel saw iron and clay. <laughs> you can go even crazier. You can, look at, you can ask them, talk about the computer inside the building. It's called the beast. <laughs> it's crazy. Look at, look at CERN, which is a company right outside there. It's called, they have a particle collider. They're looking for the God matter. <laughs> right? And guess what? Look at their logo. Google it. CERN, C-E-R-N. Google it today. Their logo is 666. You'd think someone would have gone, hmm, that's not really what we should put as a logo for our company. Amen. <laughs> but you're seeing all these tangible physical things that point to his return. That's pretty radical. Okay? After that, you've got the Temple Mount Institute. That's a group of Jewish men, hang with me, that have come together, their last name's Cohen, for 25, 28 years. They've been gathering up all the instruments for sacrifice. Now, get ready for this. This last April, they had a sacrifice on the edge of the Temple Mount and didn't get arrested. The police let them do it. The year before, they got arrested. They're ready. Now, hang with me. you got Jewish men. They're not born again yet. They haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord, but they've moved into position to have everything ready for what happens after we leave. Now hang with me, if Russia can move into position, if God can move Jewish guys into position, if all these other nations get into position, what's the church doing? Come on, I, God's not near me, He's in me. Amen? So there, there should be a heads up in all of our lives that, wow, if all these other entities are getting in position, how much more me? Now, now hang with me, there, there's, there's so much more because I want to get into it, but I don't want to overwhelm you, but hang with me. I was watching the Animal Planet channel years ago. Now I'm an ESPN guy, I'm not an Animal Planet channel. I think I've never even seen the Animal Planet since then. Israeli ornithologist. She's on there. She, now the only reason I know what an ornithologist is, it's a bird specialist. My brother was an ornithologist. Went to college for nine years. Studied birds. My dad said, what, do you learn? what did you learn? He said, I learned how to play poker. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Nine years of college for poker, praise the Lord. Amen. Money well spent. But anyway, so I'm listening to this ornithologist. She said it's the largest gathering of predatory birds ever in history. 
She said, we got 172 different species of predatory birds start showing up in the land of Israel. Man, I freaked out because I know exactly what the deal is. After the Ezekiel 38 war, he calls on the fowl of the air to come clean the land up. Seven years later, after the battle of Armageddon, he calls on the fowl of the air to come clean the land up. You've got the cleanup crew in Israel right now. Now see, if you've got nature moving into position, Russia moving into position, Jewish men that are at, ready for the Temple Mount moving into position, what's the church supposed to do? This is basically what the church is doing. Well, good to see everybody. God bless you. No. I mean, the church is looking. I have people, after preaching on, on all the signs, they'll go, well, you know, you can't be really bold about this. Looking for reasons not to obey God. I'm not looking for reasons not to obey God. I'm looking for reasons to obey God. Come on, His mercy is amazing. You know, hang with me. I was preaching in Hartford, Connecticut. Listen to how, how merciful he is. Hartford, Connecticut. Matt Nalette's the pastor's name, a Rhema graduate. I had a word of knowledge at the end that someone had damage in their thyroid and their back was damaged. I said, in fact, they want to put a needle in your thyroid and make it come alive. I said, you're healed in Jesus' name. I was in a hurry because I preached on end times. Used to call people down, you know, but I'd have weird words of knowledge because the Lord's so merciful. So I called it out and I said, you're healed. Afterwards, this guy walks up to me. He goes, hey, 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 hey. I'm the guy, I'm the guy. They want to put a needle in my, my thyroid. They want to make it come alive. I said, and he goes, I can feel it. I can feel my back. Dude, my back's healed. I said, well, man, thanks for coming. Jesus redeemed you. So no big deal. The next night we came to the service. His girlfriend walked up to me. He, she said, you don't understand about my boyfriend last night. He got healed, but you know what he said about you before we was preaching? The whole time you're preaching, he's a con man, he's a con man, he's a con man. So he don't like me, don't like my preaching, gets healed. You're just, you're just living in a very, very awesome time. I'm preaching in Craig, Colorado. Craig, Colorado, 23 degrees below zero. It's so cold you needed an engine heater for your block of your engine. I was preaching along and I felt like somebody wanted to kill me. I get that feeling a lot, you know. I don't know what that is, but anyway. <laughs> I probably said something maybe to offend somebody. I didn't mean to, but just trying to wake them up, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the whole th thought pattern about a traveling guy, pastor's office exudes decency. Traveling deal exudes urgency. So I'm preaching on something. I, I don't remember what I was preaching on. And I just felt like somebody wanted to kill me. So at the end of the service, I had a word of knowledge that someone had gotten shot in the eye. Now I have weird words of knowledge. I'm in Scott Webb's church in Birmingham. Saw a woman get, uh, catch a hook in her eye, fly fishing. Saw a man get run over by a car. Saw a woman fall down a flight of stairs. Because he, he wants to heal you. He loves you. So I'm calling this out in Craig. I said, there's someone here. You got shot in the eye. Nobody come down. I, usually, I used to do this. I would wait on the platform. I'd sit down and say, I'm not leaving until you come. And it gets people quiet when you do that. But anyway, that's the Ed Dufresne deal, you know what I'm saying? I said, I'm not leaving until you come. But I forgot. I started ministering to some other people and forgot about the guy getting shot in the eye. Well, come back to the hotel. Colleen and I went back to the hotel that afternoon, went down to the lobby to get some coffee, you know, in the middle of the afternoon. This guy comes walking up to me. He goes, hey, I was coming to the service tonight. He goes, I was coming to the service to kill you. I was like, would you like some coffee? <laughs> do you take cream and sugar? What do you need, buddy? He goes, no, I'm the guy that got shot in the eye. He goes, I was mad, didn't want to come down, said I want to kill you. It's coming to the service tonight to kill you. He said, but all of a sudden I got sight in my eye and I called on the name of the Lord and got saved. So you're living right before he returns and he wants to display his mercy and wants to display his kindness. So you got all these signs pointing to Jesus physically coming back to the planet. The Bible says at the second coming, there will be an earthquake there in Jerusalem and the temple will go up to a certain degree of height and the water from the Dead Sea will come right by Jesus and go out and heal all the waters of the earth. It, there's so much life in him, it just gets near him and quickens all the waters of the earth. Wow, he's not near you, he's in you. Amen. So that's why we've heard all these messages. He set your life up for right now. He wants to display his mercy and his kindness right here before we leave. Amen. So go over to Matthew, and we'll talk about the signals for a second, because I want, I want to give you a few signals, because there's a few more signs, but I just want to buzz through the, the signals for a second. Go to Matthew 24. you got your Bibles there. Now hang with me. When it comes to end-time preaching, you get your second coming doctrine from the Gospels. You don't get your rapture doctrine from the Gospels. Now don't get mad at me. Remember the ten virgins? The, the, they had oil. Some had oil in their lamp. He's not talking to the church there. You don't need oil in your lamp. You've got the creator of the oil. Now, people use that to scare people. You don't have oil in your lamp. You're not going to be ready. No, I'm him. As he is, so are we in this world. I might do Elvis on that one. Come on, man. <laughs> in other words, do I qualify for the rapture? Would Jesus qualify for the rapture? I'm a fragment in his body. I'm a part of his body, okay? People preach things to produce fear. For you, there is no bad news. There is no bad news. Now the Gospels, he's talking to Jewish boys, and they don't seem like they qualify, because they don't. Jesus has not been raised from the dead. 
Once you get into the epistles, you find out who you are because he's raised from the dead. Now that, 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 that right there freaks so many people out because people on TV will take a verse out of Matthew and try to put it on the church and it's not for the church. Watch what Jesus said to them in Matthew, Matthew 24. Everybody with me? <laughs> look at Matthew 24, look at verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said, See not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another, shall not be thrown down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming into the end of the world or the end of the age? Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I'm Christ. They'll deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, there'll be pestilence, there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 8, All these are the beginning of sorrows. There, he's answering their question. What will it look like? How was his answer from verse 9 to verse 23? Tribulation. Now that's not what I would have said. If you'd have asked me, what's it going to look like right before you come? I would have said, when you see the glory of God in the church and you see the gospel going all over the world, you know I'm about to come. Well, see, he wasn't talking to the church. He was talking to Jewish boys. He said, your sign for my return is seven years of tribulation. And you in the church and I in the church are watching the earth get ready for that. A couple weeks ago, NASA said, we've had so many flybys of asteroids that have come between the earth and the moon that are happening and we don't notice until afterwards. And said that the asteroids are behaving strangely. That's not really what you want to hear from NASA, amen? <laughs> like, seriously? What, what, what happens? Uh, the Bible says an asteroid hits the earth during the tribulation and makes a third of the waters radioactive. I'm preaching on that in the Ukraine. I said that the word uh, uh, wormwood's going to hit the earth. That's what the asteroid's called. They gasp. I said, what's that mean in Russian? Chernobyl. So see, the earth's getting set up for all this pressure to be on it to make a decision. I was talking about Keith Johnson last night. Pastor Keith in Saskatoon, I, I gave the altar call at the end of a service and a 96-year-old man raised his hand. I didn't even have him come down. I said, let's all lead this, this wonderful gentleman in the salvation prayer. And we prayed with him right there. And uh, the next day I went to the airport. I was leaving to go back to Tulsa. And Pastor Keith called me and said, that 96-year-old man gave his life to the Lord right there and he went home to be with the Lord last night. So, so somehow people will wait until pressure's put on them. My dad had a stroke. He mocked God his whole life. He got saved on his deathbed. He, he didn't turn until the very end. So the Lord is so merciful, he's going to put the pressure on the earth for seven years. I mean, people are fishing during the tribulation. We're not catching much. Well, duh, the water turned to blood. So it's, it's not gonna be, people aren't going to be able to go, I had no idea they're going to have a heads up. Because see, this stuff is real. I was in Israel one time, and I'm going to give you the signals right now, but I'm preaching too much. I'm going to give you the signals before we go. I was in Israel one time. I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where they just were right here. That's the, the, the olive press is what Gethsemane means. That pressure was going to be on him to be separated from the Father. And I'd taken a tour over there to meet up with another tour, and the lady in her tour, she said, Hey, Joe, I want you to do communion. Well, I couldn't remember where the communion verses were. I freaked out. I mean, I know it's 1 Corinthians 11, but I was like, oh, man, where are the communion verses? You know? So I'm standing there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I look up at the Temple Mount. You see all the, the foundations of the temple, and it's just amazing. You go, well, okay, there, there's the capital of the universe forever. So I'm freaking out because I can't remember where the verses are. All of a sudden, I had an open vision. Remember, it's okay for me to have a vision. I'm a young man. Young men see visions. Old men dream dreams. I've been having tons of dreams over the years. But anyway, I've switched over to old. But anyway, back then, I was young. I had an open vision. It's called discerning of spirits. I saw angels and demons all over the Temple Mount. And I, you can just tell it's the most active area of angels and demons on the planet. I told my buddy, Tom DeMond, a pastor from Heidelberg, I said, dude, I just had an open vision. I saw angels and demons all over the Temple Mount. He said, you better come back to earth. You've got to do, do communion. You know how your buddies keep you straight, you know? Well, the lady that was running her tour, her tour, she said, hey, there was an old prayer here named Phil Halverson. Phil and Fern Halverson were old prayers. She said he was standing here right here in the Garden of Gethsemane, had an open vision over the Temple Mount, and saw angels and demons. Said it's the most active area of angels and demons on the planet. I told Tom, I said, see, I'm not crazy. <laughs> now, see, what is that? That's Jacob's ladder. See, we think of some old rickety ladder. No, it's a location called Jerusalem where angels are going back and forth because this stuff is real. It's real. Jesus is just about to come back. It's real that God raised him from the dead. It's real that he walked on the water. It's real he walked through the wall. It's real that he was pierced in his side. Come on. This is not some fallacy. This is not some stories made up in a book. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is coming back to the planet. Amen? I mean, it, it, think about it. Well, this next sign, think about it. Aerosmith, Stephen Tyler got born again. Listen, when, when Aerosmith's getting born again, you need to lift your head up. Jesus is about to come back. 
Guess who got him saved? Uh, uh, Lenny Kravitz, the guitar player, led Stephen Tyler to the Lord. When, when Lenny Kravitz is being an evangelist, Jesus is about to come back. How many signs do you need? All right, let's talk about the signals for a minute because I know this is stuff that, that defies... I love it that the psalm says the heavens uh, declare His glory and it defies, defies language. doesn't matter where you're from, you can see the, the signs in the heavens. Genesis said that the heavens would be for signals for us. The planets would be for signals. So, of course, the devil perverted that and tried to get people to live by stars. No, that's stupid. Well, let's, let's talk about what God's doing right now as far as signals go. Last year and the year before, you had blood red moons on Passover and tabernacles. Okay, that's pretty radical. What's Passover? That's when he died for us. What's Tabernacles? The second coming, when he's going to come back and tabernacle with men. Now, that's pretty radical. I died for you, I'm coming back. <laughs> I died for you, I'm coming back. Yeah. When's the last time you had four in a row on Passover and Tabernacles? 1967, when Jerusalem was won back. 1948, when Israel's made a nation. 1492, when the Jews were kicked out of Spain, the Edict of Expulsion. So you got the heavens signaling on, on exact dates. The gap between the last two years was 19 years and 48 years. The exact year Israel's made a nation. I told the Lord, I said, oh, come on. I mean, how, how crazy is that to be that blatant? It's getting pretty blatant. Then after that, you had, you had uh, uh, solar eclipses on Nisan 1. The sun went down directly over the Temple Mount at sundown. The coordinates for the Temple Mount, the sun goes down right there. You had Mercury do a flyby of the sun. The, the planets formed a sickle. The moon formed a sickle. Orion changed his instrument to hammer. You had hammer and sickle on the same day. That's Russia's symbol. God's trying to show the Jews you're about to go through the threshing floor. I don't need these signs. I have a witness in my spirit Jesus is coming. But I'm not going to be stupid and go, I don't believe any of the signs. No, they're, they're, they're radical right in front of our face. You had the Bethlehem star last year. You could really see it here in Spokane better than anywhere in the country. First time in 2,000 years. Now, what's the Bethlehem star? Jupiter, king star. Regulus, regal, king planet. They did retrograde motion over Jerusalem at the birth of Jesus. You had Venus, men are from Mars, women from Venus. Venus is a mother planet. All three of those planets came together at the birth of Jesus. You had the Magi from Iraq uh, come to his birth, riding on a camel for 700 miles. Can you imagine them talking to each other? Are you sure a king's going to be born? This is a long ways to go by camel. Come on. I mean, my buddies would have messed with me the whole time. Going, there better be a star like we ain't never seen a star. Come on, there better be something. Well, all of a sudden, you saw Jupiter, Regulus, and Venus come together at the birth of Jesus. The constellation was Virgo. Last year, NBC Nightly News said we have a celestial event. We've got Regulus, we've got Jupiter, we've got Venus. I'm like, man, I know what that is. That's the Bethlehem star. First time in 2,000 years. So you've got blood red moons, you've got the Bethlehem star, you've got Mercury, you've got all this stuff. The Lord's so merciful, he's going like this, you've got signals. So Jesus is about to come back. So what do we do as believers? We hustle. What do we do as believers? Pastor Rick says, you know what, we're going to paint, paint, paint flaming stripes in here. I'm going to get a Batman f outfit and I'm going to fly in like Batman. And we're going to, no, I'm just kidding, come on. <laughs> no, it's just the time, just like in a race, when the white flag goes out in a car race, you don't go, oh, wow, we got one lap left. Ooh, no, people jump up and go crazy. Have you ever been to a car race on the last lap? I've, I mean, people that are quiet the whole race start screaming. The quietest person at the race. When the white flag goes, woo, let's see what happens. I mean, even the drivers go nuts. They, well, they don't care about blowing their engine. This is it, the last lap. How many signs do we need before we figure out this is it? I mean, I, the, Ezekiel prophesied of the prosperity of Israel right before the coming of the Lord. The, the fertility of the land of Israel. You can get up on the border of Syria. I was on the border of Syria, and I told the guy, my Jewish buddy, I said, do you guys sprinkler this land here? Do you use Scott Super Turf Builder for me to get my grass to look like that? I've got to use Scott's four times a year and got to sprinkler it. He goes, we don't use Scott Super Turf Builder. God's Word said, I'm going to bless the land so much that you can see where Syria is, it's brown, and where Israel is, it's lush green. Israel's the only nation that has more trees since, if any nation since they've been keeping count because God said I'll bless the dirt <laughs> I mean Lucifer named the, renamed the land Palestinians Palestine there are no such things as Palestinians that's a word that says you don't have a covenant remember David told Phil the Philistine the Goliath who is this uncircumcised Philistine he doesn't have a covenant he mocked him who are you He's a pretty big, pretty big giant. 
So the devil renamed the land saying you don't have a covenant because God said, I'm giving you this land. And the land is prosperous and blessed. We didn't, we didn't even get into all that, but the fertility of the land of Israel. Mark Twain said, he was there 100 years ago, said the land is so desolate it won't support life. Israel produces 90% of the fruit for all of Europe. You eat an apple in the morning, made in New Jersey. Eat a pear, made in New Jersey. Eat a grape, made in New Jersey. Man, what's up with New Jersey? Israel's the size of New Jersey, but produces all this for, for, for Europe. So you've got tangible, physical things that point to his return. We're privileged. We're blessed. We're, we're word people. We've heard word, 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 word. We know who we are in Christ. We have the, the authority of the name of Jesus. We have gifts of the Spirit. We've got harvesting tools. God raised you up to be a witness right here before he comes. How blessed are we? So what do we do? You know, it doesn't have to be weird. I was on a flight to Sweden. This lady goes, I don't know what's going on. I said, I know exactly what's going on. Israel's made a nation. Jerusalem's going back. Hebrew language is toward. Ethiopian Jews brought back. Fertility in the land of Israel. She goes, oh! she, she went and got another flight attendant. Tell her. Of Israel made a nation. Jerusalem went back. Hebrew language is toward. Went and got another flight attendant. We had eight flight attendants on the plane having a church service because people want to know what's going on and you have the answer. His name is Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Mm. Wow. I wonder what the protocol is going to be when all of a sudden we're, we're caught up. We have that reunion with our family members that have gone home. We stand there at the throne of God. We see that basin of fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Wow. And we look upon him who was pierced. We look upon him that gave his life. So we have a wonderful season before we're gone. I've, I've preached a long time this morning, but we're, we're going to be raptured very soon. I can't give you the date, but I can tell you that it's very, very soon. I can tell you the season you're in is of the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for all of these signs that point to your return. Help us as believers pick up the pace. Help us accelerate. We look unto you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I thank you for everyone that's here today, Lord. We, we make a renewal of our commitment to walk with you and to do the will of God. We, we hearken to the voice of the Lord, the stranger's voice we do not follow. We only do those things that please you, Father. We delight ourselves in you, Father, and you cause us to ride on the high places of the earth. We trust in you with all of our heart, and we lean not to our own understandings. Father, in all of our ways, we acknowledge you and you direct our path. The pathway of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. So, Father, lead them, guide them, direct them, strengthen them. Their households are blessed. Their kids are blessed. We thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. The number one thing he wants you to get before you leave today is how much he loves you. The whole purpose of all of these signs, he really, really, really wants it hammered into he loves you. He just flat loves you. Can't wait to see you. He's excited to go check this. You can just hear him check this out. He's going to show you around heaven, and then we're going to come back with him on white horses, and we're going to implement the kingdom of God over the earth for a thousand years, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Hey, real quick before we go, is there anyone here that you've never given your life to the Lord? I know I preached a long time, but maybe you're here. I know you came to hear Pastor Rick. Please come back and hear him. Don't judge the church on a traveling guy. Come back and hear Pastor Rick. He, he has a grace on him to bless you and strengthen you. Maybe you're here, though, and you've never made that decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Man, how cool to get saved right before the rapture. I mean, there'll probably be a plaque in your house. You're born again. Boom. People, people lick it and hit it and go, wow, you got saved right before the rapture. Is anyone here at all, you've never given your life to the Lord and you'd like to today, just slip your hand up real high. I won't embarrass you, I'll pray with you. Anyone at all, you've never done that and you want to give your life to Him. Amen. I don't see any hands, but I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. He sure loves you. One more invitation. Looks like everybody's saved. How cool. Maybe you're here and you've not had that Pentecostal experience from Acts chapter 2. They were all baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Maybe you're here and you've never done that yet. You want to do it today. Don't be embarrassed. Just say, that's me. I want to get filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're here and you've never gotten baptized in the Spirit and you want to today, just lift your hand up real high. Say, that's me. I'd like to get filled. We'll take it a second. Instantly, you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said you'd be endued with power, not weirdness power. Amen. I'll take all the power I can get. Amen. All right, looks like everybody's saved. Looks like everybody's filled. How cool is that? Well, God set you up for the last days. I'm excited to get to be with your pastors the next couple days. Just thrilled to get to be around them. I love how wild they are. They're wild thought pattern to obey God. Thank you, Jesus. 
hey, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to call you down, but I had a couple words of knowledge. You just take it right there in your seat because I've preached so long. There's someone here, you got damage in your jaw, caused you to grind your teeth. You watch. Don't see if you're healed, see that you are healed. And the other one is, is damage in your bladder. You know, I always have weird words of knowledge, so I don't try to figure it out. I just know that you're healed. I had a word of knowledge in Mark Monty Knudsen's church that someone can't, you've never written before. I've never even heard of that. I said, you can't write. I called it out and kept going. You know, this guy walks up to me afterwards, bawling like a baby. He had this disease, like dyslexia. He told me the name of it, but I can't remember. He said, I've never written before in my life. He said, I called that out, and he wrote a poem about the coming of the Lord. Never written before in his life. Last week in Texas, had a knowledge, someone had damage in their, uh, uh, their eardrum was punctured. A little girl, nine years old, screamed out, I can hear, I can hear. Preach it on end times. Let me just tell you, he, he wants to use you. Hallelujah. So your bladder's healed. Your jaw's healed. This other one's your tailbone. You know, you, you know, a lot of people have trouble with their backs. This is not your back. It's lower than your back, the base of your spine. I don't know if you fell or what happened, but, but receive it right now in your tailbone. Amen. He loves you. He loves you, loves you, loves you. This other one's real simple, and then we'll go. Uh, liquid in your eyes. Uh, your tear ducts. you got some kind of damage in your tear ducts. Just receive it. Lord, thank you for, for your water system in their eyes. Thank you for restoring them. Thank you for it, Lord. We, we appreciate that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you guys for coming. So soon we'll see him. And we've got great things to do before we leave the planet. And I sure are blessed to be, be with you. Have a great summer season. Happy Memorial Day weekend if you're a veteran. Bless you, strengthen you. God bless you. Have a great time this weekend. Look forward to seeing you real soon. Give Pastor Rick a big hand as he comes. Pastor Rick, thank you, sir. Great to be with you. Thank you, sir. Oh, bless you. No, thank you. Great to be with you. Amen. How many appreciated that? This is pretty fascinating to know that we are on God's clock, not Earth's clock. You know, and, and I remember growing up in church and some of the things he alluded to that a lot of ministers, they just, just scared the hell right out of you. Yeah. yeah. When they had that kind of experience, they came in just to frighten you into yeah. heaven. Yeah. You just, you just run, hey, I'm not, I don't want to go to hell. But I'm telling you what, there's an invitation. There's an invitation to the throne of God and a yes. relationship with God. You don't have to be afraid of end times. You, we should be welcoming it. Yes. We should have an anticipation for this. Yes. Praise the Lord. I appreciate the gift. How about you guys? Yeah. Amen. How, how many were ministered to today? And I, I just, I got every fact down that he shared today. Just. No, you know what? You can go to our web page and you can re-listen to this off of that. And you can go pick this up this afternoon on, on the, the uh, live stream record of that thing. Share it with somebody. Tell your family about it. You, you can say, this is how you go do it. If you've never unloaded the app, that's why we have the app. You see, you can read, because there's no way that you can catch every nuance that was shared, and I believe, phenomenal. I, pre I appreciate gifts like Brother Joe that are called it. This is what he preaches on all the time. And I really appreciate it. How about you? And you know, he doesn't pastor church. He doesn't have, you know, big organizations and things. He, he survives and, and works and carries this message all over the world because people give. And so let's get ready to, to give a love offering to Brother Joe to appreciate. If you appreciated it like you gestured, then give accordingly to it. Be a cheerful giver. You know, you don't give because you can afford it. You give because God has empowered you to do it. We don't give because, you know, we're emotionally do doing If you're emotional, great. If you got an inspiration, great. But you give because you love God's Word, and we love what God's doing in the earth. So there's an envelope near you, and if you want to get you can put things. There's, there's text giving and things, too. And we're going to make all, all of this. will go to Brother Joe and to bless him and uh, supply for him to be able not only bless here, but go on to the next place. Uh, we have pastors coming in this afternoon and this evening. We'll have 40, 50, thereabouts coming in. And tomorrow we have a full day with that. You can pray for that. These guys come in and they're going to get the first, some of them the first encounter with Brother Joe and their ministry. We're going to minister to the ministers so they can go and minister to people. Can you say amen to that? 
Listen, remember all of those things that we have coming up. They're not to just occupy your time. This isn't a, you know, a variety TV show. We're doing these things to change the world. You know, come to these events that we have. Invite friends. Invite people to church. Invite people to come and listen. Invite them to, to, to the live stream recordings and things. And let's get everybody that we can to be ready to go when the Lord returns. Can you say amen? Amen. God, today, I'm so thankful for our time together. I'm so thankful, Father God, for your spirit that's drawing us closer to you and taking all these wonderful different gifts that you have placed in the church. You praise apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, helps to prepare us for our entrance into heaven and your return. We uh, set all of these things before you. Bless the hand that gave. We pray for Brother Joe. We pray for our uh, pastor's events coming up. And just thank you, Lord. Our coming events are just going to be supernaturally touched by heaven. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Okay, let's give the Lord one big hand clap again for Brother Joe coming our way. Amen. Amen. Let's stand on our feet and just turn around, shake hands with a couple people. Make sure I'm so glad that you came today and you go home blessed. You go home and have a great Veterans uh, Holiday. In Jesus' name.